We're continuing our study in the life of David, and uh, I want to do something I don't often do. I'm going to begin by reading to you. Now, a fast way to put a congregation to sleep is for the minister to read his sermon. I'm not going to read the whole sermon, but I want to read a passage to you. I'm going to do it at the beginning because you usually fall asleep at the end of the sermon anyway. Uh, this is a book that I have been blessed by. I think it was given to me by the pastor who baptized me when he passed away, directed that I should get some of his books. It's written in 1888, The Life of David as Reflected in His Psalms by Alexander McLaren. This man had a way with words. And some of you might be wondering why I've taken the story of David and Bathsheba and I'm dedicating two messages to that part that some people would probably prefer I just skip right over. It's not because we want to focus on the sin of David. It's because the greatness of his transgression demonstrates the greatness of God's mercy. Let me read just a little bit to you from this master of words. Speaking of David, he writes, This saint of nearly 50 years of age, bound to God by ties which he rapturously felt and acknowledged, whose words have been the very breath of devotion for every devout heart, he forgets his longings after righteousness. He flings away the joy of divine communion, darkens his soul, ends his prosperity, brings down upon his head for all remaining years a cataract of calamities, and makes his name and his religion a target for the barbed sarcasms of each succeeding generation of scoffers. It's pretty heavy stuff. All the offenses in their whole array which God's mercies in his own past have reared, one cunning sin sweeps quite away. Every obligation to his office, as every grace of his character, is trodden underfoot by the wild beast roused in his breast. As a man, as a king, as a soldier, he's found wanting. Lust and treason and craft and murder are goodly companions for him who had said, I'll walk within my house with a perfect heart. I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. Why should we dwell on this wretched story? Because it teaches us, as no other page in history of God's church does, how the alchemy of David's love can extract sweet perfumes of penitence and praise out of the filth of sin. And therefore, though we turn with loathing from David's sin, we have to bless God for the record of it and for the lessons of hope that come from David's pardon. Yes, the uh, last sermon was dealing with the great transgression. Today we talk about great forgiveness, conversion, repentance, and there are circumstances, there are consequences that go along with the sin. Turn with me to our story where we will resume. We finished with 2 Samuel chapter 11. We will pick up now 2 Samuel chapter 12, the first verse. If you are just joining us, either on TV or you were not here last week as we studied, David committed his famous transgression with Bathsheba. He stole the wife of another man, even though he had a whole harem of his own brides. Had his friend killed to cover up his sin. As a matter of fact, I was thinking about it this week. David virtually broke every one of the Ten Commandments in this one event. Thou shalt not have other gods. Well, he made Bathsheba his god. Not to take the name of the Lord in vain. He was claiming to be God's servant while he was serving the devil. Not to worship idols. Well, he had made an idol out of lust. The Sabbath commandment. You know how he got into trouble with Bathsheba? Everyone thinks the Sabbath commandment says you're not supposed to work on the seventh day. Well, it says that, but it says you're supposed to work the other six. He was hanging around when he should have been out in the field, right? Honor your father and mother. Well, Bathsheba and Uriah and David had parents that were dishonored by this. Then thou shalt not kill. Well, he killed. That's plain enough. Thou shalt not commit adultery. He committed adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. He bore false witness. Not supposed to covet your neighbor's wife. Well, it started by coveting his neighbor's wife. He stole that which belonged to another. He broke every commandment in this. Now, you know why I wanted to reiterate that? 
Because we all fit in the story somewhere because we've all sinned. And by virtue of David's being forgiven, there's hope for all of us. Now after David sinned with Bathsheba, he thought that he at least in part successfully, at least for political purposes, there were people in the palace who knew what happened. But for political purposes, there was still enough ambiguity where they weren't sure if there was a connection between the death of Uriah and his suddenly marrying after one week of mourning Bathsheba and then her having a baby seven months later. There could be a connection, but there was no real hard, fast proof. There were rumors. And so he thought he had succeeded in protecting his name. And God gave him space to repent. You know, several months went by. The baby was born. We don't know how long after the baby was born, but Nathan approaches David. God gave him space to repent. You know, the Lord says that several times in his word. He gives his people time to repent. Before the children of Israel annihilated one of their enemies, God gave them hundreds of years to repent, the Bible tells us. The Bible says there in the book of Revelation, I gave her space to repent. God's very patient. But there's a limit to his patience. And David was under a tremendous amount of guilt and shame. There's no record that he wrote any psalms during this time. His harp was gathering dust. Because David's psalms were spirit inspired. And he had grieved away at least temporarily the Holy Spirit. In a moment we'll read from Psalm 51. And he says, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He knew that he had grieved the Spirit. In some of the Psalms of David, you read about his laying awake all night and twisting his sheets up into a knot and writhing back and forth, groaning. I wonder if he was reflecting on the time of conviction. Now, some people are under conviction, but they don't repent. They know they're wrong and they're feeling guilty, they're feeling forsaken, but they don't repent and ask for mercy. And David, I'm sure, was being beat up by his conscience every day, trying to operate as a king knowing that he was the biggest hypocrite in the world. But he would not confess and repent of his sin. So God in his mercy sends Nathan the prophet. Nathan represents the word of God. That's what prophets do. They deliver the word. Amen? What was God going to use to bring repentance to David? The word. Verse 1. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and he said, Now David used to sit and he judged his people. You read later during the time of Absalom that David, I guess, had a backlog of cases. Absalom said, David needs some help. I, I wish I was judge. But the, David was a good king. Remember Solomon judged the two women that came in? Kings would have time during each week when they would sit and the people would bring their cases. He was the Supreme Court. And Nathan brings a special case to David. There, was a certain, there were two men in one city. One rich, the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought. Cost him something for that lamb. And he nourished, fed it with a bottle because he had no mother lamb to take care of it. And it grew up together with him and his children. It was part of the family. And it ate of his own food during mealtimes. It came in the house and they'd feed it a little bread. And it drank from his own cup. Lamb would get thirsty. He'd put the cup on the floor. It's part of the family. It was like a pet. They had this warm relationship. And drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And the kids and the family snuggled up at night. The lamb would come and curl up with them. It was like a daughter to him. Now you and I are probably going, yuck. Right? You think about a lamb eating from our table and sleeping in our bed. and Oh, God could not have picked a better story for David. David was a shepherd, and the Bible says, remember when he came to his brothers, they said, with whom did you leave those few sheep? They didn't have massive flocks and herds. David knew his sheep. He loved his sheep so much, when a lion came to take one, he laid his life on the line to save one. If he had massive flocks, he might not have done that. When a bear came to take one, he laid his life on the line to save one lamb. And David, on the hills of Bethlehem, no doubt he had the little goats and the little sheep snuggle up next to him at night. He got to know them personally. He understood that there's an attachment that you develop for these creatures. You start to love them. You're tender. You've got to watch over them. And he's getting pulled into this story that Nathan's telling. Oh, yeah, I know. I had, I had a lamb like that once, he's thinking. 
And then a traveler, verse 4, came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock. Now, there was a custom in Bible times that when you invited a wayfaring person into your home, you were to provide for them. And evidently, some wealthy traveler was going through town, and this wealthy man said, stay with me. You don't want to stay with just anybody. I'm wealthy, too. He wanted to impress his guest, and it was customary to have a little feast to provide a dinner. There's examples of that in the Bible. But instead of going to his own flock, remember when uh, Abraham, the angels came to Abraham and Sarah? They ran and they prepared from their herd a, a fatted calf for these. They didn't know they were angels. Lot did the same thing when the angels came by. The book of Judges tells about when a traveler stopped in one of the tribes of Benjamin and the man prepared a feast. It was a custom in the east. But this rich man, instead of going to his thousands of sheep and goats and cattle, he knows he's got a neighbor down the road. He's got this lamb. And the Bible says, Traveler came to the rich man, verse 4, who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare for the one, the wayfaring man who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb, his one lamb, and slaughtered it and prepared it for the man who had come to him. And before Nathan can even say another word, David leaps off his throne in a rage, and David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who's done this shall surely die, and he'll restore fourfold for the lamb, because he did this thing and had no pity. Now, David was actually referring to a passage in Exodus 22, verse 1. He knew the Bible. Uh, there was a law that said that if you took somebody's sheep, if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it and sells it, he'll restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. You really didn't want to steal an ox because you had to pay five of them back. If you took a sheep, four of them. If you took a loaf of bread, one. You know how God does this? The more the value, the more you pay discourages crime that way David knew that law and he said he's not only going to die he's going to pay four times over for what he's done he's sounding very righteous he knows the scripture he's quoting the right judgments and um, Nathan says to David you are the man now they're in the palace David's got soldiers lining the wall he's got his bodyguard around some of his advisors might be there the scribe is taking notes David thought that maybe his sin had been covered. And there in the judgment hall with plenty of witnesses, Nathan says, you're the man. And then he goes on. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you more. You know, God loved David and he wanted to make David happy. And he was blessing David in every way. He was being blessed physically. He was blessed with material. He was blessed with prestige and glory and Finances. I mean, he had every earthly blessing. But when he became proud, he was no longer satisfied. Doesn't matter how much of this world's goods you have, if you don't have the Lord, you'll not be satisfied. And God said, I would have given you more if you'd asked me. That's a nice thing to underline. Sometimes we try and take what we're not supposed to have, and if we just ask for what we should have, God will give us the right thing. If you had asked me, I would have given you more, much more. Can you imagine that? God says, much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord? He cast out all ten commandments when he committed this sin. To do evil in his sight. You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. Well, everyone else thought it was battle. Now in witnesses, the whole cover-up is being exposed. You killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now therefore the sword will never depart from your house because you've despised me and you've taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. You know, the Bible says, He that lives by the sword will die by the sword. And here he had taken Uriah's wife with the sword of the children of Ammon. And now the sword was coming into his life. There is a principle. Um, Eastern religions sort of capitalize on this. They call it karma. 
you get what you give. But it's really, it's the Bible principle. They stole it from Jesus. With what measure you meet, it will be measured to you again. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Blessed are the merciful, they're going to get mercy. And those that aren't merciful, the Bible says God will plug his ears when they're in trouble. So there is a principle that what goes around comes around. That's how we used to say it on the streets. Have you discovered that? It's very true. You've taken your wife, taken your eyes wife to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house. You destroyed one man's family. I'm going to bring problems into your family. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he will lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. A very specific prophecy. For you did it secretly. I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. You think you've got to cover up? You know, Moses said, I think it's in the book of Numbers 32, verse 23. Be sure of this, your sin will find you out. Have you heard that before? Those things done in secret will someday be proclaimed from the housetop. You can hide it for a while, but you can't hide it forever. But if you do not do so, then take note, you've sinned against the Lord, and be sure your sin will find you out. Well, David had been found out. Now, God gave several judgments here. One of them was, you took someone else's wife secretly, your wives will be taken publicly. As we study on, you'll see where Absalom rebels against his father. David flees the kingdom. And the Bible says here in 2 Samuel 16, they pitched a tent for Absalom on the top of the house. David, David's palace was taken by his son when David had to flee Absalom. And Absalom went into his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. You know where that took place? On the very roof, the very veranda where he had spied Bathsheba and decided to cast that lingering lustful look that turned into murder and everything else. From that very spot, his ten of his wives were taken by his son. God's prophecies come true. His words do not fall on the ground. Amen? Now, I don't want to rush past this and go into this part about repentance without talking a little bit about the thou art the man principle. Um, I've had that happen to me a couple of times where I found myself looking down my nose at somebody else and then God, through others or circumstances, says, uh, pardon me, Doug, thou art the man. You can see several examples of this in the Bible. You remember the story of Haman? He wanted to kill all of the Jews because they wouldn't bow down to him. He didn't realize Esther was a Jew. And Esther throws a banquet. And after the third banquet she has for the king, only the king and Haman is there. And Haman's riding high. He figures, hey, I'm, I'm invited to this special feast. And Esther falls down before the king and she says, there's someone who's trying to annihilate my people and trying to, to kill us off. And, and the king says, who would dare to do that? And Haman says, yeah, who? And Esther says, thou art the man. And he ended up hanging on the gallows that had been prepared for Mordecai. Then, of course, you've got the apostle Paul. Can't wait to rid the earth of these despicable Christians following this cult leader false religion and in his zeal God appears to him and says you know Paul there's someone who's trying to fight me and Paul says who is it God says you're the man wait Lord I thought I was working for you then at the last supper Jesus says tonight someone's going to betray me someone is going to turn me into my enemies and all the disciples say Lord is it I is it I is it I and finally Judas says is it I and Christ says, Thou art the man. That's amazing. The other disciples didn't pick up on that. You know, Christ tells us, matter of fact, somebody look this up for me. Matthew chapter 7, verse 3. Hold up your hand when you're ready to read that. Matthew 7, verse 3. And while you're looking that up, let me read something to you from Romans chapter 2. Okay? Someone look up Matthew 3 and hold up your hand. We'll bring you a microphone. Romans chapter 2, verse 21. You therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? If you don't pay your tithe, you're robbing. 
You who say do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? That includes lusting in the heart. You who arbor idols, do you rob temples? Some of us have got different kinds of idols. You who make your boast in the law, you dishonor God through breaking the law. For by the name of God, the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. When we are not practicing our convictions, instead of glorifying God by taking the name of the Lord in vain, we bring reproach on His name. Now, who has that for me? Go ahead, Joan. Good to see you. Read that for me. Oh, did you hold up your hand? Who's, who's, I've got it here, Doug. Oh, you got it? Go ahead. And why do you... And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not consider the plank in your own eye? Christ in his ministry talked about this phenomenon where it's so easy for us to see what's wrong with someone else. Isn't it amazing how quickly David was ready to condemn in another what he had in his own life? Well, that man is going to die and he's going to pay for it fourfold. He was outraged at the behavior in another life, which was really in his own. Do you think that problem was exclusive with David? Or is it possible we've all got a little touch of that same disease? Being very quick to condemn and accuse and recognize sins in the lives of others, so we might be saturated with the same thing in our life and be oblivious to it. I'd like to encourage you to repeat something after me. Now, I'm not going to say I am the man because there's ladies here and that's not politically correct. You used to be able to use the word generically, but you can't anymore. I am the one. Say that with me. I am the one. That message of Nathan to David is a message from God to us. Have you talked about others when you know that you were guilty of the very same things that you were bringing up in others? Say it again. I am the one. You and I are guilty of the blood of Uriah. Remember what we said? Uriah died to cover David's sin. We think about the terrible things that that the Romans and the religious leaders did to Jesus. Say it again. I am the one. You and I are Barabbas. He took our cross. He died for our sins in our place. Knowing that ought to make us very slow to condemn others. All right, back to our story. Back in 2 Samuel chapter 12. You did this thing secretly. But what's going to happen will be happening before the whole sun. Verse 13. Now David can't escape. He is exposed. But even more than that, he's not as concerned about the people that are watching in the courtyard there in the palace. He's concerned that he has waited this long to confess to the Lord. And David says very simply, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has also put away your sin. You will not die. You know, friends, that blows me away. In one verse, verse 13. David says, I have sinned, and in that same verse, God says, you are forgiven. No sooner does David say, with a heartfelt repentance, I have sinned, than instantly God says, you are forgiven. You know, you read in Isaiah chapter 6 about the conversion of Isaiah, and right after Isaiah says, woe is me, I am undone, I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for mine eyes have seen the king. As soon as he says, woe is me, and he confesses his sin, unclean lips, God sends cleansing from the altar. As soon as we confess, he forgives. Some of us think that God has a probationary time before you're forgiven. You sin, you repent, you're on probation then you're forgiven. That's not how it works. As soon as God said to Zacchaeus, come down, I must eat at your house. Zacchaeus repented. He said, I'm going to pay everything back. He says, salvation has come to this house. Right then. As soon as David said, I have sinned, God said, your sin is forgiven. That means if you genuinely repent, your forgiveness does not hinge upon what you're going to do tomorrow. That's why some people fail of really experiencing forgiveness because they think, well, I'm sorry. God knows I'm sorry, but I don't know if he's going to forgive me because I don't know how I'm going to do tomorrow. You want to know what righteousness by faith is all about? If you really believe that you're forgiven when you really repent, you have eternal life that moment. If you know you are really forgiven instantly, it makes it so much easier for you to live a different kind of life from that point on. The reason we so quickly fall is we think, well, I'm on probation anyway. I'm not really forgiven. If you really believe you're forgiven, it affects your behavior from that moment on. You understand what I'm saying? It's a very important truth. 
As soon as he said, I have sinned, Nathan said, God has put away your sin. You will not die. However, there's repentance, but there are consequences to sin, right? Now, I don't want you to think that David simply said, oops, I sinned. There was more to his repentance than that. As a matter of fact, this would be a good place for us to turn to Psalm, who knows where I'm going, Psalm 51. And I won't be reading the whole thing, but I'll be reading the first maybe 10, 15 verses. This is the Psalm that David wrote connected with this specific sin and asking for God's forgiveness. If for no other reason, I'm glad the story of David and Bathsheba is in the Bible because you and I have Psalm 51 and I need it. I don't know about you, but I've needed it many times. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your loving kindness. Not according to my goodness, but according to his love. According to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgression. Now Nathan said when he said, Lord, I've sinned, he was taking his sin away. Wash me. Thoroughly from mine iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. You ever felt dirty? I'm not talking about physical dirt. I'm talking about, have you ever felt spiritually dirty? And then you get on your knees and you plead the blood of Jesus and you get up and you feel forgiven, clean, relieved, the burdens are gone. For I acknowledge my transgressions. This is repentance. Incidentally, repentance and confession are they're in the same category. Confession is the verbal expression of repentance. It's verbalizing sorrow for sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I'll never forget this. Against you and you only I have sinned. Now I want to jump back here to what David says. Don't lose your place in Psalm 51. But notice what David says in verse 13. I have sinned against the Lord. You'd think he'd say, I've sinned against Bathsheba and her family and the kingdom and Uriah. He says, I've sinned against the Lord. Now notice what he says in Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned. You remember when Potiphar's wife was tempting Joseph? Joseph said, how can I do this thing and sin against Potiphar? No, the Lord. Ultimately, when we sin, we're breaking whose law? God's law. All sin is ultimately against the government of God. All sin has been paid for by God. It costs him. That's not to say that he didn't sin against Uriah. You understand? But the priority is our sin against God. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. In other words, God, you saw it all. That you might be found just when you speak. God's glory had been damaged. And blameless when you judge. What would have happened to all of David's psalms he had written prior to this time... He was in his 40s probably when this happened. He had written Psalm 23. Whenever you read Psalm 23, if David had not repented, and the story is that David sinned with Bathsheba and then died in battle, how would you feel whenever you read Psalm 23? Wouldn't it kind of pollute it a little bit? It's so much easier to read the Psalms knowing that David's wife was turned back to God. That you might be just when you speak. God had been speaking through David for years. He had been spirit-filled. And blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity. We're all born with these sinful natures. And in sin, my mother conceived me. That doesn't mean David was born through an illicit relationship. What it means is we are born with these carnal sinful natures. And in sin, my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in me. You reading with me? Inward parts. Where does God want the truth? From the heart. David was putting it all on the outside, but he had lost it in the heart. You want truth in the inward parts. In the hidden part, you'll make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I will be clean. What did they used to use to paint the blood of the Passover lamb over the door? Hyssop. It's like a little broom brush. And so it's talking about the blood of Christ. Purge me with the blood of Christ and I'll be clean. He understood what these things meant. He wrote more psalms about the Messiah than anyone else. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. Isaiah quotes him in Isaiah 1.18. Make me to hear joy and gladness. He had not felt joy for some time since his sin. That the bones which you have broken might rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. You know, God is the great creator. Every Sabbath day, we're remembering a, a memorial of the creation. 
during the Easter season, we think of the resurrection, which is a, a very powerful emblem of God's creative power to bring life out of inanimate dead material. But the greatest evidence of God's creative power is when he gives us a new heart and a new mind. How do you get that? It's a miracle. You have to ask for it. It's an act of creation. How did God create in the beginning? He spoke. The word of God created. How is God going to create a new heart in you and me? Through his word. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew. It had been there. He lost it. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. And do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous or free spirit. Know what happens after we repent and we confess? It says, then, verse 13, then I will teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. You want to see the church grow? Do you want to see the church grow? Some of you thinking I couldn't find a parking place, Doug, I'm not sure. We still want the church to grow. It's God's church, amen? He'll take care of these other problems. If you, could, if you could sing Psalm 51 down to verse 12, if you could pray this as a prayer and mean it from your heart, the next thing happens. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. If we're not converted and we're teaching transgressors, we're just hypocrites, aren't we? And sinners will be converted. This, friends, is the secret to revival. Humbling ourselves for the Lord, putting away our sins, confessing our sins. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation, and my tongue, will, my tongue will sing aloud your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth shall show forth your praise. You know, nobody knew how to praise God like David. I mean, he danced before the Lord. He'd sing. He made instruments. He had people singing in the temple. Sometimes we'll sing our opening hymn, and we'll sing at church, and I'll look at you folks, and I'll think, they need Psalm 51. They're not singing about salvation because maybe they don't know they're saved. Maybe they're not. Maybe they've asked for it and they don't believe in it. But if we really believe we were dead and now we're alive, if we were covered with the dark sin of David, picture yourself, and then you're forgiven and restored, you'd have something to sing about, amen? You'd sing a little louder. You might even be a little more on key. If you, you know, we get into those minor chords when we're guilty. Let's go back to our story. Back to 2 Samuel chapter 12. David said, I've sinned. However, verse 14, God forgave him when he asked. Repentance comes when we ask. You know, there was a, a, an advertisement for a soap a number of years ago. And it showed a boy walking. He looked over his shoulder at the shadow behind him. And the advertisement said, this is the only thing that this soap can't wash away. A shadow. Now, the blood of Jesus washes away every sin. But it does not necessarily wash away the consequences of our decisions. You already know that, don't you? Jesus turned to the thief hanging on the cross next to him and said, Verily I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. And all those nails popped out of his hands and feet and he walked away. No. You remember Carla Faye Tucker was executed a little while ago. Guilty of murder. She admitted her guilt. Went through, I think, a dramatic conversion in prison. They appealed that she might go free now because she's converted. The government says she's still guilty of murder. We're glad she's a Christian. But she's got to be executed. That was a tough decision. Nathan says, however... There's still a shadow behind you, David. Because by this deed you've given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. You know, when Christians sin, what happens to the, the lost in the world? What do they do with that information? They blaspheme. They use it as an excuse. Uh, there are times when all of a sudden the church or, or different prominent Christians are in the media that they failed in some way and atheists love that you know the, the comedians and the night talk shows they love to jab and ridicule and scoff and mock and blaspheme and make a joke about the hypocrites in the church when you and I profess to follow Christ and we live like David and Bathsheba you give great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme 
And there are consequences. This child that was born as a result of a big cover-up, it said, the child also whom is born to you shall surely die. <gasps> That's a tough scripture. The most innocent party in this whole thing is the baby. First of all, keep perspective. Does this mean the baby's lost? No. Sometimes we look at things on an earthly point of view. God could have been sparing the baby from all kinds of miserable life. That baby died because of their sin. That baby was innocent. Did someone innocent die because of your sin? Let me, see, let me say it another way and see if you catch it. That baby was a son of David. It was a son of David. It wasn't the son of Uriah, though David tried to make it look like that at one time. The son of David, that innocent son of David, died to cover the sin. Are you getting it? Who is Jesus, the son of David? Not only for David, but because of the kingdom. And Nathan departed to his house. He gives the word of God and he walks out. You know, that's what Elijah did. He gave the word to Ahab and he left. You, you probably wish my sermons would be that way. Just say it and sit down, Doug, right? <laughs> and the Lord struck the child. Now, this is another difficult scripture. If you read in the Old Testament... You've got to keep in mind that God gave the devil permission to smite Job. Remember what happens behind the scenes. God had to give the devil permission to make this child sick. God doesn't make people sick. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. But God, the Bible, the Hebrews understood that God is sovereign over everything. And God had to withdraw his protection from that child. And the devil came in and gave him some kind of problem, some sickness. And the Bible doesn't elaborate on what it is. Notice what it says. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David. What are they calling Bathsheba? Uriah's wife. And it became very ill. David therefore pleaded with the Lord for the child. And David fasted. And he went in and he lay all night on the ground. So the elders of the house arose and went to him to raise him from the ground. But he would not, nor did he eat food with them. Then on the seventh day, now I don't want to rush past that, I've heard a lot of people use the sin of David as an excuse for their sins. Well, you know what David did? He murdered and he committed adultery. And yeah, I'm bad, but I'm not that bad. A lot of people love to use David's failure as an excuse for their failure. Have you heard this done before? I very rarely hear people use David's repentance as a model. They want to model after David's sin, but they don't want to model after his repentance. I've yet to see someone lay on their face on the cold, wet ground seven days and fast and pray for someone else. That's pretty... I mean, what more could he do? That's as humble as you could be. He got as low as he could get. He got right down his face in the dirt, covered himself with sackcloth and ashes and would not eat for seven days. If that baby had lived eight days, he would have fasted eight days. If that baby had lived 20 days, David would have stayed on his face 20 days praying for that baby. You don't see that kind of repentance much anymore. We're always really quick to excuse ourselves. Before God can really forgive us, we've got to acknowledge our guilt. I heard a number of years ago about how King Frederick II went to visit a prison in Germany. And as soon as the prisoners saw him walking into the, the uh, courtyard there, they all ran up and fell on their knees and they said, I'm innocent, I didn't do it, and this is much too severe, and I'm not guilty. And they're all pleading for mercy from the king because like the governor, he could commute their sentence. He could set them free with a word. And he noticed one man over against the wall just filing his fingernails. And he called them, he said, why are you here? He said, armed robbery, your honor. I deserve every day that I'm here. And the the king said to the guard, he said, you need to let that man go free. I don't want him corrupting all these innocent people. Sometimes in the church, you know, we play very pious and religious, and we're, uh, we're hesitant to acknowledge that we are sinners. And uh, we need to know how to hold each other up and pray for one another. You need to find somebody who's a Christian you can confide in. 
You know, we disciple each other. We grow together. Someone you can be close to, you can confide in, and doesn't mean you treat them like your priest. There's some things you don't want to tell anybody but God. Amen? But the Bible does say confess our faults to one another and pray for one another that we might be healed. We need to experience that kind of repentance. He laid on his face for seven days. And the Bible says after seven days, the child died. I'm in verse 18. And the servants of David were afraid to tell him the child was dead. For they said, indeed, while the child was still alive, we spoke to him. And he wouldn't heed our voice. Now what's he going to do? How can we tell him the child is dead? He might do some harm. He might commit suicide. They didn't know what he was going to do. They were afraid. They'd never seen David act like this. And when David saw that his servants were whispering, and David was really sharp. He had the, the wisdom of Solomon in his genes. David said to his servants, is the child dead? They said, he is dead. So David arose from the ground. And he washed and anointed himself. And he changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. He didn't go into the church and shake his fist at God and say, I prayed seven days and you didn't answer my prayer. David, well, you know, Nathan the prophet had said, the child is going to die. Perhaps David remembered of Jonah. I don't know if Jonah hadn't happened yet, actually. Perhaps, but he, he knew the stories about where you can pray, you know, and, and sometimes God will relent like he did with Jonah. But um, God said no to this prayer, even after seven days. And he accepted God's will. He went into the house of the Lord and he worshipped. You know something interesting here? It never says that David offered a sacrifice for his sins. It was customary to go offer a lamb or a bull or something. He went and he prayed. That child died for their sin. David later says in his Psalms, The blood of calves and bulls and goats you do not desire. He knew that Christ, God's Son, would someday die for his sins. Probably better than anybody in the Old Testament. He worshipped the Lord. And he went to his own house and asked to give him some food. And he ate. And his servant said to him, What is this you're doing? This is backwards, David. You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. They used to do that after the death. When the child died, you arose and ate food. And David said, While the child was still alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, Who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me that the child might live? The Lord might repent of his decision. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. In other words, I could go to the funeral. I can go look at the little baby. I can comfort Bathsheba. But he'll not return to me. Now, underline that in your Bible. He will not return to me. That's a good scripture because there are people who think that when loved ones die, they do return. In other words, come and talk to you. My dead husband or grandmother is visiting me. You'll go to a funeral and say, yeah, they're, they're up there in heaven. They're watching us. He says, no, he's dead and he'll not return to me. The dead know not anything. They have no more a part in anything that is done in this life under this sun, Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Notice in verse 24. Then David comforted Bathsheba, his wife. Now, the Lord forgave David. I was hoping I'd have a minute to talk about this. David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and he went into her, and he lay with her. So she bore a son and called his name Solomon. And the Lord loved him. Notice what it says at the end of verse 27, chapter 11. What David did displeased the Lord. She bore a son and displeased the Lord. David took Bathsheba for his own selfish gratification. And that displeased the Lord. Now David goes to Bathsheba in love to comfort her. He's not thinking about himself. He's thinking about her. She's now being viewed by God as his wife. And the Bible says the Lord loved that son. Name was Solomon. One of the things about pastoring that is the most complex and confusing for me is the scrambled marital problems that you find in the church. I understand that one in one in two, even among Christians, marriages end in divorce. It's not much better than the world. And sometimes I'll have people that come to an evangelistic meeting, they want to accept the Lord, they've been out in the world, maybe they were raised Christians, maybe they weren't. 
They've been out in the world. They've been married and divorced a half a dozen times. And they come to church. They're married to their latest spouse. They say, I want to accept the Lord. What do I do? Do I go back and find the original? I mean, what do I do? And there are pastors that teach that. And that's really bad. Sometimes they've got new children. You cannot unscramble scrambled eggs. You know, sometimes there's sin, and sometimes we come to the Lord with a sinful past and all the consequences and the baggage of that past, but you come like you are. And then God ultimately says, All right, David, you really blew it, but her husband's dead, you have a baby, this is your wife now. And he recognized them as a married couple from that point on. Not only that, God gave David back a ministry. David began to lead again. He began to write spirit-filled psalms again. And that tells me that there can be a future after some of this marital mess-up that people get into. But it only comes after genuine repentance for the mistakes. Somebody look at a scripture for me. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6. When you find that, raise your hand. Matthew 1, verse 6. This is the genealogies of Jesus. That's the begats. Most of you jump over that when you start reading the New Testament, right? So-and-so begats, so-and-so begats, so-and-so. You just uh, jump past that. Somebody, when you find that, raise your hand if you got a microphone back here. Hold your hand up, good and tall. Matthew chapter 1, verse 6, talking about the genealogies of Jesus. Jesus. And, Jesse. And Jesus. And Jesse. And Jesse. We got David. He got David. The king. The king. And David. And David. The king. The king. We got Solomon. We got Solomon of, of her. Of her. That had been. Had been the wife, the wife of Uriah. Uriah. Did you get that? And Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon by her who had been the wife of Uriah. Now think about this, friends. Jesus is an ancestor of David through Solomon, who was the result of the union of David and Bathsheba. I've wondered before, you know, the Bible tells us that Nabal died, and after Nabal died, who had been given David a hard time, David took Abigail, Nabal's wife, and they had a good relationship, and he never had a, any problem with Abigail's kids. She was a good mother. Could it be, will you allow me to speculate for a minute? You know, David blew it, blew it, blew it, because when he was told, I'm going to make you king, he had a lot of chances to take the throne, kill Saul for himself, but he waited on God. Is it possible that if David had not taken things, if he had looked and seen Bathsheba and said, man, that's a knockout, but she's not my wife, if he had turned away and done the right thing and minded his own business, word could have come, Uriah has died naturally in battle, and he could have had Bathsheba. We'll never know now. God tells, I would have given you much more. Sometimes we blow things because we do things our way. It's like Abraham with Hagar. He couldn't wait on God. And it caused all kinds of problems, even to this very day. Because Abraham took that extra wife. You know, uh, I don't think it's an accident that the Bible, well, it, it says here that David comforted his wife and she gave birth, he knew her, and in love, baby was born named Solomon. As a result of that relationship, the Bible says God loved him. Matter of fact, even Nathan liked Solomon. He gave him his own name, and the name was um, Jedediah, which means God's darling. Solomon was a good kid. I mean, David was good looking, Bathsheba was good looking, he was good looking, he was smart, he was healthy. Solomon was packaged well. And all of the grief from that former time, Solomon really brought a lot of joy back into the palace because God was blessing what had been cursed before. Now, there were problems that came into David's life, as you're going to read on. He had problems with that. Amnon, he said, you're going to pay fourfold. You know, David lost four children. He lost the baby. We never know the name of that baby. Amnon, Absalom, and Adonijah, four sons of David, died in connection with his sin. Remember, David said, you'll pay fourfold. Well, that curse came on his own family. You know what Amnon means? Faithful. Absalom, father of peace. 
Adonijah. Adonai is God. Jah is Jehovah. God is Lord. David lost the Lord and peace and faith with that sin. And that's what sin does to you and me. You know, the reason this is a wonderful story is you start the New Testament by going through the genealogy of Christ. And the Bible tells us that the first baby of David died because of his sin. The next baby of David and Bathsheba rose, the son of David, and Christ came through that seed as a symbol of God's mercy. God is punctuating how thoroughly he forgives you and me by bringing Christ through the family with all of that pollution. If he can do that for David, he can do it for you and me. Amen. You have been listening to another special American Christian Ministries presentation. This is a digital recording for optimum sound quality. International copyright, all rights reserved. To order a copy of this or other presentations or for a free catalog, please call toll-free 800-233-4450. International calls dial 717-652-7000. You may also order from our secure website at www.americanchristianministry.org. There you will discover the largest selection of authentic Adventist preaching available. You can trust ACM. There's no compromise here. If American Christian Ministries has been a blessing to you, why not take a moment just now and send us a note or an email with your testimony? We'll share it with the speakers and volunteer workers to encourage them. Your prayers and continued financial support are very important to ensure the continuation of this ministry as we help prepare America and the world to meet Jesus Christ. He is coming soon.